Welcome. We've got people from all over the world here. Um, we've got someone from Texas. Welcome. Uh, Burlington, uh, Sarnia. Welcome. Welcome. Waterloo and Paris and Toronto. Uh, some from Cambridge. Um, welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's so lovely to, well, kind of somewhat virtually see you here. All right, and I think we are officially live on Facebook. Welcome, my Facebook people. Um, please, we've been asking to see where everybody is from. So if you want, you can leave a Facebook. Comment. Welcome, my Facebook people. A comment in the Facebook section if you would like. Um, and just to let us know where you're from. We are, we always, I always like to know where everyone's watching our programs from. Um, and we'll get started in just a few more moments. I'm just going to wait for everybody to kind of settle down and settle in. Uh, we have some people watching from Bracebridge and Toronto and Ottawa. Welcome, welcome. And let me see where else people are watching from. A lot of Ontario, Preston, from Montreal, Oakville. Welcome, everybody. All right, and I think we're getting, looks like people are starting to settle in. Okay. How about I, I'll get this show on the road, I think. I think everybody looks like they're signing in with no problems. Good evening, everybody. My name is Veronica Wilson, and I'm really glad that you could join us tonight. Um, I want to say thank you to Councillor Donna Reed and the City of Cambridge for being a sponsor of our Celebration of Women series. Um, we have a fabulous event uh, for you tonight. Um, uh, Elka and Kaylee are going to have a wonderful conversation about The Hen Artist. Um, it's just a wonderful book. I devoured it all in one weekend. Um, and I just, I couldn't stop talking about it afterwards. So I'm, I'm really glad and we are very lucky to have Elka here with us tonight. Um, but before we start, I do uh, have to go over a few housekeeping items. If you're watching this through our Facebook page, um, and if you start to see any random links in the comment section, just ignore them. They are um, spam bots. Uh, we're not ever going to ask you for any personal information or um, for any of your financial information as well. We will, myself and Jen, will be working hard to uh, remove them as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, the second uh, item I need to talk about is that even though this is a virtual event, um, Idea Exchange's Code of Conduct still applies. Basically, all we're asking you is to be kind and respectful to um, uh, the author, moderator, staff, and fellow attendees. Um, and uh, But if you can't be respectful, and if you do decide to post anything that's inappropriate, I will um, remove you from the program. But I can feel through the computer that this is an amazing audience that is excited to see Elka as I am. Um, and I know we're going to have a wonderful night. Um, if you are interested in purchasing The Henna Artist, um, if you're from the area, our uh, book partner uh, is The Bookshelf from Guelph. Um, but if you're not from the, um, the area, you're more than welcome to, uh, I would recommend, uh, purchasing the book from a local independent bookstore. Um, they would appreciate uh, your support during these crazy times. Um, the layout for the event will be like this. Uh, uh, Kaylee will introduce Elka and then they'll have a talk for about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, while they're talking, please do feel free to send us any questions. Uh, for the people who are, are watching this event through Zoom, you can give your questions into um, the Q&A section um, or depending on what device you're watching it from, you may have to use the chat room. For the people who are watching this event on Facebook, you can just leave the questions in the comment section and I will pass them over to Kaylee. We are going to have a bigger crowd tonight, so we may or may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will do our best to do that, um, to get to as many as we can. Um, I know there's going to be lots because it's such a wonderful book. Without further ado, I'm sure everybody would like to get to the main event, um, and I would like to introduce Kaylee. Here she comes. Yay! Um, and oh. There we go. Kaylee is a writer, um, a book lover, just like me, and just an all around fabulous person. We have been lucky enough to have Kaylee moderate um, uh, past book events with us. Um, and she's going to be working with us um, for future events as well. Uh, it's 
it's always so nice to be able to find a kindred spirit who enjoys books as much as I do. So thank you so much. Veronica, thank you. I'm very excited to be here and talk about a book that I just absolutely adored. Um, All right. I will let, I'll let you do it. Okay. Good. We'll get going so we can bring the star of the show on for today. Um, so as Veronica said, um, I'm going to be chatting with Alka, but I would like to tell you a little bit about her before we get going. So Alka is a graduate of Stanford University and received her MFA from the California College of the Arts. Um, before becoming an author, she has had a career as an advertising copywriter, a marketing consultant, and an illustrator. She was born in India and came over to the U.S. when she was aged nine. Um, and today she lives in beautiful California with her husband and two pups. So welcome, Alka. Um, I'm very excited to get a chance to talk with you. Thank you for having me today. I just can't help but think that your room is looking so much brighter than mine with the, <laughs> you know, the beautiful fall darkness that I have right now. <laughs> Yeah, it is. So it's bright and sunny here. Uh, it's only four o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, we still have evening uh, coming on. But I imagine you guys already have your evening uh, upon you. <laughs> we, we, we have the dark, the, the dark, the sun sets by about seven these days. Wow. Um, now, before I begin, um, as Veronica said, we are going to chat. I have a ton of comments and questions to get to you. Um, but for anyone watching, you've got the book behind you, but I'm just going to hold up this book. So the henna artist um, has kind of taken the book world by storm. You debuted this year, which brand new book, first time author, came out in March, right during the height of the pandemic. And Reese Witherspoon loved it. You were um, her, I believe it was her May book pick. Right. Um, and the henna artist, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to pick this up, let me just say it's a great holiday gift. Um, but it has been on bestseller lists all around the world. And for any of my Canadian um, watchers, Indigo just released their top 10 books of 2020, and the henna artist was on it. So congratulations, Elka. That is, can I just say, what a wonderful success. <laughs> Thank you. You know, so many readers say, wow, that was like a, an overnight success. But considering the fact <laughs> that it took me 10 years to put this book together, it feels more like, uh, you know, a 10 year success. <laughs> it's like, okay, get it out. Let's go on to the next one, I bet. Oh, and yeah. And you know, and you know, the sequel's coming, Kaylee, right? It's coming out in July. And it's called The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. And then after that, there will be even a third book. So oh, it'll be really good. That one. That's exciting. So a ton of questions, but I'm going to start with this one. So how does it feel to have basically a baby that you carried around for a decade? You went, <laughs> you know, an incredible time birthing this child um, and she's here. How has your experience been um, with this past year? Oh, it's been so exciting. It's been overwhelming, first of all. I didn't know at the time that I started writing that I was really writing something that uh, first of all, it came from my heart because uh, Lakshmi is patterned after my mother. You know, she looks like my mother. She has my mother's resilient spirit. But in addition to that, it is a life that I merely imagined for my mother, a life she could have had where she got to choose her own destiny, where she got to make all the choices that she didn't actually get to make in her real life. Um, and then I realized, wow, I'm also writing a book that has a lot of my personal philosophy and I think my mother's philosophy about women and the choices they get to have or don't get to have in their lives. And then I realized I'm also writing a book that talks about India and the resilience of the Indian people and what was happening in the 1950s uh, after the British left. So uh, it's actually turned out to be a much more multi-layered book than I think it was 10 years ago when I first started, which I think has been that process of the 10 years. That's how, why it took me so long because I wanted to get so many different messages in here and trying not to um, you know, have one message overtake the other, but trying to incorporate all of that organically into the novel. I think I'm going to give just a really quick summary. Um, we will give no spoilers, I promise. It's, it's hard sometimes, but um, 
just because I think we'll help everyone with our conversation. But the book follows, a, I'm going to say she's a young woman because she's 30, um, um, but a young woman who has escaped an arranged marriage, an abusive marriage, and has basically set out to find her own destiny. Mm -hmm. And when we pick up um, Lakshmi's life, it's 13 years later from when she has left her, her situation and she is building this dream life. And she discovers she has a 13 year old sister she's never met. And that's really the inciting incident that changes her whole path and her whole dream. Mm -hmm. um, as I was reading it, I couldn't help but think of two things, Alka, and I, I, I want us to comment on both of them. One, um, for someone who has been grounded in my, literally in my house for the last six months, um, this felt like a trip. Um, this felt like the best travel I have been on in years. And I wanted to ask you a bit about, you know, clearly there's a lot of work in the sensory aspect of this book. Don't read this book if you're hungry. Um, <laughs> don't read this book if you're cold. And <laughs> I just wanted to ask you like, how, how did you layer you, your, your writing reminds me almost of some of the classics that you do reference um, with your, your, your deep detail without being overdramatic. And I just wanted to ask you what your process was with that. You know, I love reading books that had a lot of detail in them, that have sensory experiences in them. Because first and foremost, I am a writer. And I mean, uh, excuse me, I'm an artist. And so because I'm an artist, I see things in color. I imagine them in my head. I have uh, tremendous dreams. I mean, my dreams are feel so real sometimes. And, um, you know, when I imagine a scene, I imagine everybody's clothing. I imagine the colors in the room. I know where everybody is seated. I know what the sofa looks like and what the paintings on the wall looks like. So, so all of this is in my imagination before I ever start writing anything down. So it's very hard for me to even write without sensory uh, experience woven in because that is just the way I experience the writing itself. And then I think the other thing is that, you know, I was in advertising and marketing for 30 years. And when you're in that world, you are involved in all the sensory experiences because whatever you're trying to sell, whether it's a product or a service, you are trying to entice someone else to buy it. And the best way to do that, I've always felt, is to make them hungry for it, to make them visually uh, uh, crazy about it, uh, you know, just to make them, uh, take them on a trip in their mind that makes them crave that particular thing. So for me, it's second nature to write this way because it's the way I experience life. I also couldn't help but when I was reading and researching your book, um, note that you did end up going back to India. Well, first you actually went to India with your, mo with your mother, um, who you've already mentioned. Um, has been a huge part of this book and she has since passed before the book was published. Um, but I feel like there's a certain element of her in that story, obviously there's a lot, but that these trips became a very important part of the book. Um, was there anything, obviously books change from the beginning of our ideas, but was there something, something that finally clicked when you started to see this country through your mother's eyes? Um. You know, I think more uh, of what clicked was that what my mother remembered about India was also the same thing I remembered as a child. Since I lived there till the age of nine and we had moved to five different cities by the time I was nine, um, I knew Rajasthan really well and I knew Shimla pretty well because we had uh, been going back and forth to Shimla during the hot summers. So those were two areas I really understood and when I started to talk to my mom about her childhood and what she had read as books and what she had played as games and who her friends had been and, you know, what grades uh, she liked the best. Um, when I started to talk to her, I thought, well, this is the India that I remember from the 50s, too, because I was born in 1958. So I think what it did for me, it, it, is, it kind of dovetailed her experience with my experience. And I was suddenly able to explain to people what my India was all about. And this was an India that I couldn't explain when I was nine and first in the United States as an immigrant. It was really hard for me to uh, understand that 
the Americans who thought about India only thought about poverty and illiteracy and dusty and unclean environments because that was not the India that I came from. But in making all of these trips to Jaipur and talking to my mother and in uh, sort of remembering a lot of our growing up in India, I was able to recount that India. And, you know, I, I don't know if um, I can convey how important it is for a child to be able to see themselves in a piece of literature or on the screen or in a movie. It was not something I could see when I was nine. I didn't see very many Indians like me either in school or in the movies or in literature. But to be able to put that in a story now and to have all these readers around the world say, I am saving this for my daughter so that she can read it and she can know, um, you know the power of women that you have put in this book, the, the, the beauty of India that you have put in this book. And I have all of these readers who say, I want to go to India now. I've never been, I've never even thought about going to India, but now I want to experience this world. I want to see the beauty that you're talking about. And then there's all a whole bunch of other readers who say, I want to know what henna is about. I want to experience henna on my hands or um, on my uh, crown because, um, you know, a lot of women who have lost their hair now get henna done on their skulls. Uh, and I want to know what that calming, soothing feeling is like. So, um, you know, it's reached people on so many different levels just talking about India and what you know, what was happening in India at that time. It makes people want to go there, which I just think is terrific, you know, and it's put me in touch with a lot of people whom I never would have encountered had I not written a book like this. Um, and it just makes me so grateful for uh, readers who get so passionate about books, the way I get passionate about books. Like I wanna live in the worlds that I read. I wanna be with those characters. I wanna talk to them. I wanna take them out to lunch and say, now what were you thinking when you did this? <laughs> <laughs> There's a few times in this book where I think I could easily do that. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, Kaylee, I also got really hungry when I was writing the book. So every now and then I would have to stop and I'd have to go get myself some Indian food or some samosas or make myself a cup of chai because I would be so hungry. <laughs> I, uh, I'm glad to hear I wasn't the only one. Um, and I did love that you actually had recipes in the back of the book. You have um, a henna recipe. So for anyone who is interested, um, I don't think I could ever do any of the detailed work that I have seen of artists do um, yeah. but I was very interested in that and then there were some the food recipes I think I'm going to have to uh, crack out this winter <laughs> give me some warmth during the cold weather here now you know a lot of the um, designs that Lakshmi is putting on her clients hands and feet and bellies and breasts and wherever um, a lot of those I just imagined in my head I haven't actually seen henna artists do that. And I didn't do a lot of henna myself before I wrote this book. Um, in fact, I'd never uh, done henna in my life. So, um, but as a, you know, when you grow up in India, you grow up with a lot of henna. So you grow up watching your mother and your aunts and your sisters, everybody's got henna on when there's a wedding or when there's a big festival going on. And so as a girl, you always want it on your hands too. You know, you want to be included. Um, but for Lakshmi, I made up everything that she did on people's um, hands because I wanted her to be a very different kind of henna artist, a henna artist who actually makes her clients realize their desires. And if they want to spend an afternoon in bed with their husband and, and want it to be magical, that she will help them do that with her henna and the things that she feeds them while the henna is drying. Um, if somebody really wants a baby very desperately, then she would help uh, in, you know, make sure that that can happen with the things that she's feeding them and by painting all of those babies on Kanta's belly. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I, I created in my mind a, a henna artist who does very unique kinds of henna, which is why she's paid 10 times what anybody else has paid and which is why she can actually afford to buy land and, and build her own house. And there's a really interesting dynamic that you build between Lakshmi and the cast of women that we meet, these women that are her clients who are, you know, at a very different social status than she is. But you, you, you get this sense that because she is so skilled, um, 
she has a different level of respect and freedom, even though she's very cautious about it. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of those female dynamics in the book. Yeah. So, um, you know, in India, and I think this is probably true in any culture, there are socioeconomic classes and they all have these invisible boundaries that women have to operate in. So Parvati, who is in a very high socioeconomic class and has a husband with a very good job and a uh, pedigree of um, being able to be related to the royal family, uh, she has a very high opinion of herself and tends to treat everyone else as if they might be a little bit less than. Uh, Lakshmi, even though she is of a very high caste, the Brahmin caste, because she services people's feet in the service of henna, um, she is treated as a fallen Brahmin. So she can be treated a little bit less than. So she may sit on the same couch as the ladies, but the way that they speak to her, the insinuations that they make are sometimes very, um, uh, oh, offensive. You know, they can be taken offensively. Lakshmi tries never to take them that way because she needs these ladies. She needs the money that they are giving her to build her house. Um, and then of course, there are the there is the whole servant class of people. And the servant classes are completely at the behest of the people who run the households. They can be fired on whim, they can be hired on whim, uh, they are either in favor or out of favor with uh, the people they service. Then you have the Maharani's who are on this very other level of socioeconomic status. I mean, they have wealth uh, unparalleled wealth, and they have gorgeous jewels and gorgeous saris and so on. But even they are beholden to a certain set of restrictions. Even they are not able to do whatever they want whenever they want. Our older Maharani was never given the ability to have her own children by her husband. And I found out through my research that many Maharajas believed their astrologers when the astrologer said, you know, your natural born son is going to try to dethrone you. They believed them completely. And so they did not allow their natural born child to become the crown prince and then the Maharaja. They would hire from another warrior caste family, uh, you know, some child that they can bring up in the palace and teach them all of the, you know, royal things that they need to learn. So the older Maharani is, uh, you know, restricted by that. And then the younger Maharani is restricted because her, because her own husband sent their child away to be educated in England, even though she would really love to have had him close by. He was the only child she had and so on. So I think in any culture, we find that we are all somehow restricted. And I think one of the things I'm trying to get across in the book is that no matter what boundaries a woman lives within, she finds her agency. She finds some way to hold on to some part of herself that is real, some part of her power that she can exert over that little small boundary. And I think you created these incredible women who, you know, you put them in tight situations and you put them through, you know, pain and, and, decisions that impacted more than the, just themselves mm -hmm. and and you pushed them and I think that was something that I also took away was that you know I mean Lakshmi really believed in herself at the end of the day she never lost that faith and it was I think really inspiring especially even in 2020 to be reminded of that really important idea that a woman still can make her own cast her own fate Oh, yeah. And you know, um, all of my readers around the world, they all say, uh, because, you know, the majority of them are women, and they say that they are still struggling with a lot of the same issues, the same issues of patriarchy or uh, gender uh, parity. They are still struggling with uh, many of those same issues that the women of the henna artist are. And I think that, you know, over time, women take two steps forward and we are made to take a step back. Then two steps forward, then we're made to take a step back. So um, I think that women are constantly in this struggle, trying to maintain an identity, trying to get that ounce of power that they really need in order to be whole, in order to feel like they have something to contribute, in order to have dignity in life. 
Um, so, you know, I have had in my book clubs, uh, women who are uh, 30 years old and they're physicians in New York and they tell me patriarchy is alive and well in the medical system. Mm -hmm. And then I have women who are in their 60s who have been in the corporate world, who have retired, who say, you know, patriarchy was alive and well while I was working the entire time. Yes, we have uh, gained some parity in certain areas, but I myself have felt the disparity in uh, the corporate world when I was in the corporate world. And um, it is, uh, it requires all the power that you have, all the, you have to marshal all the resources within yourself to fight that kind of disparity and to be able to say, I matter, I matter, give me a voice because I matter. <laughs> and to keep helping each other, which I think is yeah. something that also happens uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, um, when I left the uh, advertising agency world, one of the things that I really felt was that there was no way I could ever go beyond a certain ceiling. I just couldn't do it. I tried and tried and I just couldn't do it. So um, one of the things that I did was start my own agency. And when I did that, I was empowered to only hire women. So I hired women as my art directors and my writers and my event producers. And I found that they worked so much harder, just like I did. They worked hard to accomplish the goals that we set. They worked hard to make clients happy. And they worked, I think, more than uh, they even intended to, more than they were asked to, just because they wanted the projects to be super successful. And that kind of led me to hire women also just in my private life. So I hire female contractors uh, to do work on my houses. I, I hire female electricians and female plumbers because these are, uh, you know, when, when I can find them because they exist, they're out there and they need our support. And the only way that we are going to give other women power is if we help them get that power. <laughs> it's, it's true, it's, it's many, many voices kind of make the, make the song sing, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, another, there's, there's a lot of themes that we can talk about um, in The Henna Artist, but um, one that I found really, really interesting because we see it both through a teenager's eyes as well as adult's eyes, um, is the importance of education. Um, the importance yeah. of education for young women. And you've set the book in 1950s India, which is a time when, I mean, most of the world was still going through a dramatic amount of change, but India especially was changing its whole, whole way of living in a pretty short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, that time period, especially for young women? Yes. Um, you know, the first line of the book says independence changed everything and independence changed nothing. So yes, independence changed some of the infrastructure, uh, physical and uh, environmental and um, uh, uh, structural um, in terms of uh, Congress uh, and how people were going to be educated. So it changed a lot of that. But what it didn't change was the status of women. Women were still completely beholden to their husbands, to their fathers, to their children. They really had no uh, equity of their own. You know, whatever they fought for, they had to scramble to get. So um, I think it hasn't changed that much for women, uh, but it depends on how much education they have. So all throughout my life, my father has been a huge stressor of education. And it is education that makes the difference between a girl who gets to have some sort of agency in her life and a, and a girl who doesn't. Um, and in India, the middle class has grown a lot. So middle class parents are able to send their girls to college which has been a huge boon for those girls. Not only are those girls getting a voice, they're learning how to talk about themselves, to ask for their own uh, you know, a gender parity in all kinds of situations. They are fighting for the rights of women everywhere all over India. They're fighting for LGBTQ rights. Um, so they're fighting for the rights of village girls also to get educated. So this is making a big difference. These middle class girls who are now able to go to college and get higher educations, they're able to get their BAs and their MAs and their PhDs. And they in turn are helping the women behind them. 
In the lower socioeconomic classes, however, if a girl does not get to go to, uh, does not even get to finish middle school or high school, then she has very little chance of changing her life. She is going to be married at an early age to get her away from the breakfast table. Um, and she is going to be um, having children at an early age. And so then once again, that cycle will start where she will be at the behest of her, uh, first her father and then her husband and then her children and with very little to say about herself. Uh, I think that, you know, there are all kinds of NGOs in, um, uh, India that are trying to change that, that are trying to help. And I myself am involved in a program called Room to Read, which is helping illiteracy uh, for girls uh, in not just in rural India, but also all over the world in rural areas where girls are oftentimes the last to be educated, right? If there are boys in the family, boys will get educated over the girls. Boys will always get uh, the privileges that the girls don't get. Now, what is fair about that in this world when we all know, Kaylee, you and I and everybody on this call, that girls are the ones that are going to save our planet, that girls are the ones who really um, understand multitasking, they are smart, they are adaptable, uh, they learn quickly, they work hard, um, they deserve so much of our time and attention. So, um, yes, so in India, you know, we still have a socioeconomic difference between the girls who get an education and the girls who don't get an education, but everybody is trying to help change that. There are so many people who are trying to help change that. And the girls themselves are, you know, last year when I was in Jaipur, I went to speak at several middle schools and high schools and colleges. And at this one middle school, they said, we wanna take you around back. We have a separate school set up for the village girls. They bus in village girls from five or six different villages nearby in Jaipur. And they are teaching them their mats and their letters. They're all given uniforms. They're all given their, um, their uh, books and whatever learning tools they need. And then these girls are also taught basic uh, income generating skills like the art of henna which I just found so amazing because they are learning uh, to do this craft that if something happens in their family, if their husbands, when they are married at a young age, if their husbands are injured or if they're hurt or if they turn out to not be good husbands, then these women still have some way of making a living. Uh, another thing they're taught to do is sew. Uh, another thing they're taught to do is paint or um, you know, create block art uh, for textiles and things like that. So I, I think that uh, there are lots of people trying to help and I don't think that that's gonna stop anytime soon because everybody realizes the potential of women and girls. <laughs> it's, it's half the population in the world. I mean, it's we, we make up quite a bit in, in order you know, the power of teaching someone, a young woman, something that she can actually provide for herself with, I yeah. think is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, and this is why it's so important for Lakshmi to build this house by herself, to do it without a man helping her. Because I think she's trying to learn that she can do it on her own, that she doesn't have to rely on somebody else to make it happen for her. And I think that's definitely a message that my mother imbued me with. She was always all about, honey, before you get married, make sure that you have a way to earn a living by yourself. Make sure that you can be financially whole, can be financially uh, sustainable all by yourself before you have kids, before you have a marriage. I just think that that message just got ingrained in my bed, <laughs> you know, in my head. It's just, it's all embedded in there. <laughs> it's like granite. It's never going to come out. Um, more about. Yeah. And, and it gives you so much confidence in yourself to know when you can do that. Well, and I think even with your commentary on some of the women of the different social um, castes who don't have that opportunity, um, you know, Lakshmi actually knows who she is as a person and knows what she's good at, what kind of skills she has to offer um, yeah. as, as an individual. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I remember, you know, in, in the in the working world, I often felt uh, so discouraged, so dis disheartened uh, by people who's, who kind of said, oh, you don't know how to do that, or you're too ambitious. Uh, why, why do you keep asking for more money when, you know, you don't deserve it? Uh, or, you know, uh, that one too. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you, you probably can't handle this really important project. So we're just going to give it to the guys in the next office. You know, there's a lot of that that happens. And um, I think what I'm trying to say through Lakshmi's journey is she also runs into a lot of obstacles. She runs into a lot of people who do not believe in her. She runs into people who are eager to put her down for whatever reason, just to make themselves feel better or because they feel they can. Uh, you know, who knows what are all the reasons why somebody does that to us. But in the end, I wanted her to succeed. I wanted her to be able to um, say, I believed in myself and I made this happen, but then also to be able to walk away from that kind of success because monetary success is not the only kind of success in our world. And I think for Lakshmi, it's knowing she's strong enough to build herself up again, yeah. but also something that we haven't talked about. And I, I'm looking at the time, we have about five minutes left of chatting and then I'll open us up to um, questions. And I do want to ask about your writing process and the next books. Okay. But the one thing that you really brought out with her um, was family, was her found family. Um, <clears throat> and I think, um, I think that's something that we can talk about a lot, even in today's world, that many of us are lucky to have had the family we're born into. Some of us don't want to be in the families we're born into. <laughs> but that there is something very strong about those friends and people that you gather through your life that you yeah. build your own fa found family with. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to, I guess this is more of a statement, but just how you've ended the henna artists with her together with her motley crew, including a parrot um, of her found family, yeah. I thought was really, really touching because it showed the new, the new circle she had started, I think. Right. You know, Lakshmi uh, doesn't want children in the same way that I, you know, never wanted children. But it doesn't mean that women who don't want children can't be nurturing or that they can't be loving towards people or that they can't create their own families. I think there are so many different definitions of family. And the definition I'm creating here is one that includes blood and uh, friendship. And I think that we do it throughout our lives. I think we forget that we do this all the time and we do it very naturally. We form families wherever we live, wherever we move to, uh, wherever we go to school. And um, these are very important relationships in our lives. And these are all people that we help along the way. We don't always stay in touch with people in our lives, right? But for the period of time that we are with them, they are our family. They are propping us up when we are down. We are propping them up when they are down. We are helping them through tough situations and they're doing likewise for us. So um, I really wanted to pay homage to that kind of friendship, to that kind of family that we all do create uh, and kind of give kudos to us as human beings for doing that. And I think, as someone who is also single and has chosen not to have children, it's that idea that you can have those valuable, strong relationships without threatening other women either. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, as women, and I tried to show so many different kinds of women in the henna artist, women who absolutely want children, women who don't want children, women who want a career, women who really love being at home and uh, being a homemaker. Uh, we have so many different kinds of women in this world, and we all deserve a seat at the table, and we all deserve to support each other. Uh, and I'm trying to show also in the novel that there are so many women who do support um, their friends, support the other women in their lives. Uh, there are men who support us in our lives. And then, you know, there are men who don't. Uh, so just like in real life, I've tried to make these characters with their strengths, their weaknesses, their good points and their bad points, uh, because none of us is perfect, right, Kaylee? Nobody's perfect. And um, to have a novel where everybody's perfect would just be boring because that just isn't real life. Real life is filled with a lot of uh, crazy stuff that goes on, uh, challenges that we face every day, conflicts with other people. And I wanted to imbue the novel with all of that reality as well. But then I wanted to leave 
on a hopeful note, because I think that one of my charters as an author is to provide hope to people, to say that no matter what you've been through, life does get better. No matter what you've been through, you can change yourself into something else that is more positive, that is going to stand you in good stead. I think it's always possible. I mean, look at me, I'm 62 years old. I never knew I would write one novel, much less a trilogy, much less be involved in a TV production. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that at any age of my life, I have had a chance to reinvent myself and I have gone into it because why not? There's nobody stopping us <laughs> from doing that. So uh, I think that it is possible for everybody out there who's listening to also reinvent their lives, to find that hope uh, for their future that I think Lakshmi does. I think you, you just answered one of my questions about um, you know, what, what kind of advice do you have to writers um, who, are, who are trying to, to get their manuscripts done and published? Um, there is a sense sometimes in the writing world that you have to be young and fire and you have to get your first public book published before you're 30 or else you're, you know, you're never going to be that success. And, you know, you know, those, you know, I have to laugh every time I see those articles, which oh. says, you know, 30 under 30 and 10 under 40, as if somehow uh, being able to make it uh, when you're young is a hallmark of huge success. Well, frankly, I think it's kind of terrifying to have a success really early in life, because what are you gonna follow it up with? There are so many of those stars that fizzle out because they can't, um, they can't follow it up with something fabulous, right? And so I think that it's perfectly okay to take your time and to uh, let your maturity get to the point where you feel like you should be creating something uh, in book form, in painting form, in film form, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, you know, our world now allows us to do things like that at any age. <laughs> I want to, I want like a top 50 over 50 of people who are doing yes. unique things. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that I could not have written this book at the age of 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50, right? I, I started at the age of 51. But I think it's because I have learned so many things now. So many of the things I have learned or things I think about my moral compass is in this book. And um, so many of the things my mother taught me and that I appreciate now in a way that I couldn't have appreciated when I was 20 or 30. Uh, those are all in the book as well. So many things my father has taught me. These are all in the book because now I, I have processed all of this stuff. Now I understand why I was taught some of the things I was taught, right? Because when you're, when you're younger, you think, I know more than my mother. I know more than my father. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. Just stop it right now. <laughs> so, um, but then as you get older, you go, oh, I see. Okay. So some of people who are older than me kind of know what's going on. <laughs> Parents and people are kind of smart. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here's the other thing, Kaylee. I don't think I could have listened to my editors and my agent and all of the various reviewers I had unless I were at the age I am now. Um, I think that, you know, I can listen more to people. I can allow a lot more to come in and to process it. Uh, whereas I think when I'm younger and I think I know more than everybody else, I, I can't even allow a lot of that critique to come in. But now I can, and I'm so glad I did because so many people have helped me on this journey and it's been incredible because they have. I think that's, I think that's a really- Oh, yes, okay, and you did ask me for advice uh, to writers. So guess what? I have been asked by the Kepler's Literary Foundation to actually teach three writing classes, which I'm doing starting this coming Tuesday. Okay. And then the following Tuesday, the 27th, of October and then the following uh, like November 10th. And each one of these I'm gonna teach according to what I have learned about writing a bestseller, about publishing, how, how do you find agents um, and about uh, how where do you go once you have written the book. The thing about writing a book is this is only a quarter of the work. Yep. This is only a quarter of the work. After this, you have to go talk about the book you have to find out in your own mind why you wrote the book, why you felt it was important for people to read this book and how you communicate that to the world. You can also go on and develop new careers. You can become a public speaker. You can become a memoirist. Uh, 
uh, and talk about your journey. You can, uh, you know, as I'm doing now, working on the um, film production of whatever work, you know, the screen adaptation of your work. So there's so many different things you can do. Uh, so anyway, I encourage you all to, you know, go to my uh, Instagram uh, account and find out uh, all about the classes that I'm teaching. It's Perfect. Fun. So that's the best place to send everyone. Yes. Um, and you are the, I have your channel somewhere. Where did it just go? Your handle. It's, uh, is it's, it's at the Alka Joshi. Yeah. We will make sure um, Veronica will put that in the chat and on the Facebook page in case people are looking to follow up with that. Cool. I do have a few questions from the audience. I could, I, I barely touched my list of themes I want to talk about. <laughs> Some other time, you and I are going to talk about the symbolism um, in Jane Eyre and the henna artist. And there's a lot, there's a lot I still want to ask you, but okay. we'll see that maybe for the next time you come and chat. Okay. Um, but I have a few questions. One is um, from Sandy, who wants to know if you always intended this to be a trilogy when you started 10 years ago, or has it grown into this trilogy? I never thought of this being a trilogy at all. But you know, all of those 10 years that I was writing The Henna Artist, there are a lot of pages in the book in, in multiple drafts uh, because you're reading about the 30th draft of the book. So in all of those other drafts, I have these pages that didn't make it into the final. I have about 140 pages. And so I have other epilogues that didn't make it into the final. I have prologues that didn't make it into the final. So I kind of had an idea of what's going to happen in Malik's life and what's going to happen in Radha's life already. And so then when uh, I was finished with the henna artist and I was starting another project, Malik kept bugging me as a character in my head. And yes, he kept saying, I, <laughs> I want you, you know, he's so cheeky. He's like, I want you to write a story about me. And so I started then writing his story and it came very easily, very smoothly, because by now I know these characters so well, they live in my imagination all the time. And I love the world that they inhabit. So I like going there. Then I had an epilogue I had written way into the future when Radha is 35 years old and she is a perfumer in France. And so that became the third book. So, uh, so the second book is more about Malik and then of course Lakshmi and all the other characters. And the third book is more about Radha and Lakshmi and then all the other characters. So it's, it's, um, it's like a family now, you know, that I turn to for solace. <laughs> And Malik's book starts a little after when we've left them in the Hen Artist, right? About 10, 15 years. Did I read yeah, that? 12, yeah, exactly. Oh. 12 years after uh, his story starts because he's 20 now and he's old enough to have a love interest and uh, he's old enough to, you know, talk back to Lakshmi, really. <laughs> he was already. Yeah, he always was. He always was <laughs> old enough, right? <laughs> he was probably actually one of my most delightful characters. I just enjoyed every time he was on the page. Oh, yeah, I adore him too. I think he is a little bit patterned after, uh, you know, I have a younger brother who is uh, cheeky like that and also very loyal to the family. And he's my go-to for, you know, asking any questions about business because he just seems to know everything. Uh, and then also Malik is like a lot of street children and I wanted to pay homage to them, the survivors of this world who don't really seem to have parents or their parents are very busy earning a living. But you know, these kids are running around making uh, things work for them. Uh, you know, they're very, uh, they're very hardy. They're, they're just, they're survivors. They are, uh, you know, they're always looking for uh, another way to make money so that they can, I don't know, get some cigarettes or <laughs> get a, get a motorbike or something. Um, I still have more questions coming in. Um, one is, and I love this question, actually, what are you reading right now? Aha. Uh -huh. Now, um, so far this year, you guys, my library has been filled with books that I have to read because I'm introducing other authors. So, um, you know, I've read, I think about five books in that vein. And right now I am reading uh, Sarah uh, McCraw Crow's work. Uh, it's called, um, it's called a, a diff, uh, it's called The Wrong Kind of Woman. <laughs> That's a great title. I have, I have so many books by my bedside. It's just like that New Yorker cartoon where the stack is so high that it's threatening to kill me. You know, one of these days, 
I will not be on a Zoom call, you guys. And if I'm not on your Zoom call, it's because the books have crushed me to death. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that a lot, actually. I sometimes worry about that in my own house. <laughs> and you know, and you know, okay, so here's, and here's what I do to relax. Here is, oh, uh, and I also just read uh, Min Jin Lee's, uh, no, no, no. Um, last year I read Min Jin Lee's Pachinko, which I absolutely adored. Uh, you know, it's the story about the South Koreans coming to Japan. Um, and it was like a saga of four generations. And I love those kind of things because I can get so involved and I, you know, it's, 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 uh, I'm just in that world for so long. Um, but the thing I do to de-stress, to, to decompress from all the writing and the reading that I have to do, I watch police procedurals. <laughs> I watch CSI, I watch anything having to do with, um, you know, uh, murder mysteries. Uh, I, I don't like gore, I don't like blood, but I like uh, like the, the, the whodunit part of it, you know? Um, so that is uh, a lot of fun. And I must say that Canadians are coming out with some really good uh, murder mysteries. Um, I think, wasn't the killing out of um, Canada? I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, uh, I'm misunderstanding, but um, you know, that was a great series uh, that I got a chance to see. But so I love bingeable series. Yep. I always tell myself, Kaylee, I'm going to watch one. I'm going to watch two tonight. And I end up watching like four because I cannot help myself. I am addicted to bingeable series. So that's why when we uh, were talking to Miramax, I said, I really want this to be a bingeable series. This has to be bingeable. Uh, when Gotham Group, my, um, my screen uh, agency in LA, when they went out uh, to field proposals from people, they said, okay, she wants a series. She doesn't want a movie, she wants a series. So that, those are the only kind of proposals we're gonna get. So Miramax TV is calling this a uh, Indian Downton Abbey, which I think is all that. phenomenal. I love that, I can see it. Uh, I can see how lush and creamy it's going to be and how gorgeously, you know, it's going to be shot. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, and you are writing the screenplay. No, I'm not yeah, actually. Okay. So um, I've never written a screenplay. And so I am in the writer's room as okay. an executive producer, which means I get to give a lot of feedback on the script and I get to tell them uh, maybe uh, how about, uh, you know, doing a scene where we have Parvati doing this and Lakshmi doing that and Radha doing that and maybe they're all separate from one another. Um, so I get to suggest scenes that might be filler scenes in between uh, some key uh, things that are going on, because I think to do a six to eight episode series, they're going to need a little more content uh, and they're going to have to give Frida Pinto a break because she is not only starring as Lakshmi, and you know, since this is first person, every single scene has Lakshmi in it, uh, but she's also an executive producer, Frida is. And so they said, let's not kill Frida by having her on every single scene. <laughs> let's not be what you want known for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I cannot wait to watch it. Cool. And uh, so what are some of your other uh, questions that you didn't get, get to? We, we actually still have a couple from our Q&A. Um, okay. One of them is actually just a statement and it is someone who is commenting on when Lakshmi realized that she was, what she was doing was making women feel better, but that what she wanted to do was make them better, um, which is really what she was trained to do. And huh. I did want to bring that up because I thought that was a really interesting statement because you, you slip it in at the end of the novel and it's part yeah. of her kind of, her whole circle, her realization of what she's moving towards. Um, but it's a really poignant statement, I think, about the role of women helping each other. Um, what, you know what, this is one of those great examples when a, a reader gives me an insight into the book that I myself had not had. I love that. Making them uh, feel better versus, tell me that again, please, Kelly. Um, actually making them better making them better okay wow which is definitely oh. that you know she 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 goes from pampering and beautifying these women yeah. and still helping them feel better but really where her path is taking her is through that that healing and that medicine and that other part of her um, where she's actually going to change people's lives at a very physical level 
Yeah. And isn't that kind of what we all want? We all want to be helpful to people. We all want to help them in some way. Uh, we, we want, you know, when people come to us for advice or they want us uh, to service them in some way that, that they know we can do, like whether it's uh, doing their hair or whether it's helping them with an essay or, you know, helping them fix their car. Um, I, I think we all we all want to rise to that occasion. We all want to help other people uh, get better and stronger and smarter and all of that. And so, yeah, I what a great observation she has made earlier. They were uh, Lakshmi was making women feel better, but now she just wants to make them better. Sure. I love that. And you know, she's always trying to do that with Radha. She's always trying to make Radha a better person. And she's always trying to make Malik a better person. And the same thing with uh, Kanta. You know, she wants to make things okay for Kanta too. I think I have time for one last question. Um, and it is about your process. So I'm thinking um, 10 years for one book. In the next couple of years, you've got two books coming out. How do you write a story? Are you a plotter? Do you have everything down in cue cards? What is, what is your process like? My process is like stringing a necklace. I start with a scene and in the scene I have characters and they are doing things in that scene. And I visualize it in my head. I work all the way through it in my head. I even work the dialogue in my head first. And then I start writing it down on my computer. Then I will work, like I'll imagine another scene. And then I will work on who are the characters in that scene? What is happening in that scene? Why is it important to even have that scene? And then I take all of these big scenes together and then I thread them together with littler beads so that the scenes all form a story. And I think through that process and going through that process over and over and over again, I understand what the story is about. So no, I don't start out at the beginning knowing what the story is all about. And, um, you know, I know John Irving does that. He says he starts with the last line of the story and he knows what the story is going to be about. I am not John Irving. <laughs> I am not that kind of writer. I am more of an organic writer and I like feeling my way through the story because it surprises me too. I don't know what's going to happen. I didn't, you know, okay, I, I can't, I can't do spoilers. So, so uh, I'm not going to go there, but I didn't <laughs> know that some of the characters were going to end up surprising us in the way that they have. Even I was surprised. Even I was like, Geeta, where did she come from? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is delightful. That is absolutely delightful. Keeps it exciting as well, I think. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the thing is be, about being a writer is if you can't be surprised and pleased by your characters, your readers can't be surprised and pleased by your characters. If your characters are boring the crap out of you, you're going to bore your readers too. <laughs> so you have to keep everything interesting and lively and you have to keep these characters uh, on their toes so they can keep you on your toes. <laughs> Elka, I have to say that has been an hour and I would just like to thank you for your time because that hour absolutely flew by on a Sunday night. It did. It totally flew by. I can't even believe it's an hour. Oh my gosh. I can't believe it. Our time is up. No. So I'm going to thank you and I believe Veronica is going to come back on to wrap up with us, but stay with us. Um, okay. Thank you so much for everything. That was thank you, Kaylee. That was a lovely, lovely uh, interview. And by the way, I love your setting in the back. I like that really dark wall that you have back there. Thank you. Yeah. I did you do colors? Did you do that yourself? I the, did. The wall? I wow. Did. It's, it's very deep navy. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Because you know, you know what it does is like then you uh, really pop out of that that whole thing, you know, your, your, um, that mustard color shirt that you have on kind of an olive shirt and then your glasses and your lipstick. Woo. Thank you. I will take that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh, well, thank you both. I, uh, what an amazing night. Like Kaylee said, I can't, I can't believe it's, it's eight o'clock. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, this is, I think this is one of the reasons why I love author events so much because it's just, you get sucked in so easily into the conversation and the world, just like as if you're reading a book. I, with your book, I, I was going to read just the first page because I had like two other books started 
And next thing I knew, like it was Sunday and your book was done. <laughs> oh my God. So, so you're a, you're a binge worthy person also. <laughs> I, you know, I think, I think we need to start a binge club because there's so many of us who just love to binge. <laughs> I've had uh, many, many, many book hangovers, as I like to call them, where I feel like a zombie after, and I realize that the world has carried on even after I've read this amazing book. And then I'm, I'm out telling everyone that they need to read this amazing book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so fantastic. I want to thank all the readers out there. Wow. I just cannot believe that, you know, so many people are loving it. And also I encourage everybody to always um, chat with me. Uh, you can DM me on my Instagram. You can uh, contact me through my website, thehennaartist.com. You can, uh, in the back of the book, there are different ways to get a hold of me and people do. And uh, I love to hear from readers. So you want to call me? You what? You have a question for me? I'm there. <laughs> awesome! That's great. Oh, and I got to tell you, I have done over 200 book clubs, oh which is really great because you guys not only is this allowing me to talk to readers, but it's allowing them also to have contact with somebody outside of their personal sphere. And I think right now it's so important. Like I feel every time I have a book club, I feel like I have a whole new set of friends now I just made around the world. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, it's so priceless during this time when we're all kind of locked down. I know. But someday soon we'll get to go somewhere <laughs> special. I know. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the perks of, you know, virtual is that we are able to actually have you come and be a part of our, you know, yeah clubs because you know um it always just amazes me and that's why I always ask where everyone's watching from too because it just it kind of blows my mind where we are so connected even though I know we're all kind of stuck at home right now yeah so connected but you know but you know what is wonderful uh Veronica is that every time something bad happens like the pandemic really good things will come out of anything bad that happens even when you lose a job, the possibility of doing something new happens, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're, you're on to another path. With the pandemic, now we are all so used to Zoom events that we can talk to people all around the world and feel really comfortable in this format. And we don't even have to schlep suitcases around, you know? So, <laughs> although it might be nice to take a trip every now and then. <laughs> in your bed at night is lovely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... Uh... I agree. I agree. It's, uh, it's awesome. I, and I just, I want to thank you. And I want to thank the audience for, you know, being a part of this event and um, my two colleagues that you can't see right now, everybody, Gabrielle and Jen, who have been uh, wonderful um, in helping me uh, work in the background. Uh, and I would like to thank Cindy from HarperCollins Canada, who is just a dear and a Yay, Cindy. <laughs> uh, she's just a wonderful, and if, if it wasn't for HarperCollins uh, Canada and, and just all the publishers, uh, publishing houses for just being so wonderful and supporting us, the libraries and whatnot, we wouldn't be able to do these events. So thank you. Um, and I do want to know, because this audience, I think, will appreciate this event that we have coming up. It's a Tea Time with History, um, and it's an author event with uh, Jennifer Roberts. Robson, uh, Kristen Harmel, and Daniel R. Graham. That event's happening on Sunday, November the 8th at 2 p.m. So that's a historical fiction um, panel. So, and Kaylee, she's on this side for me. I don't know where she is, everybody else, but she will be leading that discussion. So if you love listening to her um, lead the uh, talk, then you will definitely enjoy this. Uh, event. So thank you, everybody. And have a great night and or great day, depending on where you're watching from. Uh, and we will see you uh, next time. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Good night.